Hi guys, welcome to my talk. This is Hidden in Plain Sight. New insights on how fasting research connects keto, glycogen stores, and cholesterol. These are my conflicts of interest. And this is my bio and my COVID-19 look, which you'll never see again as the missus is not too uh, happy with facial hair. I am a senior software engineer and entrepreneur, which you probably knew that. And you probably knew that I'm also an obsessive biohacker. But I can now add a new title, which is I'm also the chief executive officer of the Citizen Science Foundation, which we've just now been uh, certified as a public charity, a fully qualified 501c3 public charity. Woo now, you've heard me talk a lot before about the lipidergen model which is that many going on a low-carb diet observe their cholesterol levels rise and through a series of experiments, myself and many others have helped find connections between metabolic changes and cholesterol levels. I have and continue to hypothesize these cholesterol levels are highly influenced by the trafficking of fat around the body in lipoproteins, the boats your body makes. So I'm going to start this off with a pretty funny question. What can this bag teach us about fat storage? Of course, you know you're looking right now at a mesh bag full of golf balls. What if you couldn't open or close this bag? But what if you could break the balls apart to small enough pieces to get through the mesh holes? If you could, then, then you'd have some idea on how fat-based storage works. So, let me introduce you to triglycerides. This is the storage form of fat-based fuel, commonly found in adipocytes and lipoproteins, and it's big, it's bulky, so it stays within membranes really well. Now, when it's time for you to go ahead and take them out, with the help of some enzymes, you break them apart process called deesterification, and now they can fit through the membrane, which is great. I want you to know what these, con these constituent components are because they're going to be very relevant to this larger story. It's glycerol and free fatty acids. So glycerol is a simple polyol compound. It's very soluble in the bloodstream, so it mixes in well. It travels easily, and it's commonly used by the liver to generate glucose, a process known as gluconeogenesis. And then there's free fatty acids. This is the free form of fat-based fuel, and it's very insoluble in water, so it's commonly found um, attached to albumin, a very, a very prominent protein in the bloodstream. And this small molecule can easily slip through membranes. And what's happening over and over again is these two are being converted back and forth to each other, triglycerides being deesterified into glycerol and free fatty acids, and then both of those being uh, reesterified back into triglycerides to get inside of membranes and uh, remain there because that's, again, the, the storage form of fat. So with that in mind, let's talk about the lipid energy model. On the left side, we've got body fat. Just imagine it's all the body fat. And on the right side, we have the liver. And in the middle, we've got tissues in need. And think of this in the context of you're moving from a mixed diet or a carb-centric diet to a low-carb diet. So we leave it with this. When healthy and going on a low-carb diet, we hypothesize that a higher continual release of free fatty acids from adipocytes, those are your fat cells, can provide those fatty acids to tissues in need. This makes sense because as you're losing weight and you need to draw on those fatty acids, that's where you can get them from. But also, there's a higher uptake of free fatty acids by the liver. And that's important because they can break down those fatty acids for higher production of ketone bodies. This is a process known as ketogenesis. And everything I've just now showed you it's not controversial. Everyone agrees on it. There's really no debate. Uh, the next part's going to get a bit trickier. What we posit is that actually there's a higher re-esterification of triglycerides in the liver, as in these free fatty acids are now being recomposed into triglyceride cargo. And now there's a higher secretion 
of this triglyceride cargo on board lipoproteins, particularly VLDLs. This in turn results in greater direct supply of VLDL to both adipose and non-adipose tissues. Further, there's higher turnover of these VLDL in delivering this triglyceride cargo to these tissues. And then there's the final money shot, which is that this has a higher resulting number of LDL particles. So, those VLDLs that are leaving, just you know, bloated with these triglycerides, they're dropping off their cargo very rapidly. There's just this high turnover. And what do you call a VLDL that's been relieved of all of its triglyceride cargo? Well, it's an LDL, full stop. This, however, is controversial. This process and all of its parts are something that there's quite a lot of debating uh, with me and many others, not just outside the low-carb community, but also inside the low-carb community. And it's good, it's healthy. So now we have to look for clues for each of these steps. And that's a lot of what we're doing now. We're putting together the paper, looking for all of the research beyond just what we've been able to do with our own experiments that can either help confirm or disconfirm this model. So what do we do? We go to the latest studies on low-carb diets, but there's a problem with that. See, what is considered low-carb in much of the literature is often very different than the standards of the low-carb community. Uh, first off, many studies use high fat in combination with moderate levels of carbs, yet consider this low-carb based on the proportion of each. Many studies use seed oils as a primary source of fat, particularly for animal models. And some studies retrospectively just extrapolate a low-carb diet based on existing mixed diet data, where even the lowest proportion group being called, quote, low-carb, is nowhere close to under 100 grams or 5% of calories per day from carbs. Look, bottom line is, I need to be looking at people who we know for sure are fat adapted. And the same thing with the animal models. We have to be confident that it's a very comparable case. So the question then becomes, are there studies of people on something close to a low-carb diet? Well, of course there are. It's called fasting. And this is great because now we can compare fasting, which I like to call the endogenous low-carb diet, to the very low-carb slash ketogenic diet. So on the very low-carb diet, you're consuming what? Low-carb, high-fat. With fasting, you're consuming nothing. But past that point, they're pretty much in sync with each other. They ultimately result in higher fat adaptation, of course. There's greater fat mobilization for fueling tissues. And there's substantially increased ketosis. However, I will add that we definitely know on the ketogenic side that when, there's, when you're healthy and metabolically flexible, this can often result in higher cholesterol levels. But will we see the same thing on the fasting side? For those going on a low-carb diet, changes in cholesterol levels often vary based on their existing metabolic health. So where obese and or metabolically challenged, cholesterol levels generally drop, stay the same, or increase marginally. Think the Verda data set. Whereas where lean and or metabolically flexible, cholesterol levels are more likely to increase. In many cases, increase substantially. Think uh, Volek and Finney. Will we see these differences with fasting? Well, I'm happy to say that I've got a fairly good study that's pretty instructive, and it's looking at very prolonged fasting, 72 hours, in those of lean and obese men. So here's the breakdown. These, are, these people are actually pretty young, around 24 years of age, and the BMI is strikingly different. It's 21 for those who are lean. For the obese, it's 35. And the fat mass, although this is in kilograms, I'll kind of convert it for you. It's around 22 pounds of fat mass for the lean, but 97 pounds of fat mass for the obese. So quite a difference, a full fold difference in fat mass. And what I like is they took a lot of great blood work 
one thing I do kind of want to call out real quick is that they took this blood work not just at 12 hours and 72 hours fasted, but that at 72 hours of fasted, both the lean and obese actually synced up a lot on a lot of key metrics. See peptide, glucose, glucagon. And this is this was actually pretty impressive. In fact, it's probably some of the most powerful data, I think, to be suggestive of why people who are obese may want to consider doing 72 hours of fasting. But what I'm really interested in are free fatty acids and glycerol. Before I tell you what happened, let's revisit. Those who are lean have roughly, their average is around 22 pounds of fat mass, compared to those on the obese side with 97 pounds of fat mass. And they lost pretty close to the same weight with actually the lean side losing just a little bit less. Bear that in mind when we compare these blood markers, starting with glycerol. So on the glycerol side, you see at 12 hours fasted, the lean have slightly less glycerol levels than the obese. And the same is reflected on the free fatty acid side. The obese have just slightly more in the bloodstream. But what happens at 72 hours? It changes quite substantially, both in glycerol and in free fatty acids. The lean side has close to 50% more than the obese. In spite of less weight lost, we see substantially greater glycerol and free fatty acids in the blood of the lean cohort. But this would make sense in the context of the model. This can be very suggestive of greater lipolysis and lipoprotein turnover on the lean side of the fence. And these important differences in lipid changes further highlight the relevance of metabolic health status, both for low carb and fasting conditions. So please bear that in mind moving forward. Now, many, maybe the higher LDL we see with low carb diets and fasting could be explained by either greater cholesterol synthesis, or maybe it's just lower clearance of LDL particles, leaving more of them in play. Well, for that, I'm going to introduce you to PCSK9 and cholesterol synthesis in the context of fasting. Before I do, though, I need to tell you about PCSK9 because probably about 90% of you who are watching this have no idea what that is. So this is an LDL receptor. And excuse the bad artwork, but this is just going to be a simple model. Imagine this is sitting on top of a cell. And of course, as LDL receptors do, they bind to LDL particles. And usually, along with their friends, they bring those LDL particles in. And that same LDL receptor can come back out to capture more LDL particles. But now let's change the context a little bit. In this case, it's going to bind to an LDL particle. But along comes a very famous protein called PCSK9. And what it does is it tags the LDL receptor so that when it's brought in, it then heads to something called the lysosome, where it will now get degraded. So what does this mean? In short, what it means is that if you have more PCSK9, you're going to have more LDL because less are being cleared from the bloodstream. There's less LDL receptors pulling them away because those PCSK9 keep tagging those LDL receptors to get degraded, leaving more of the LDL particles out there. Uh, of course, conversely, less PCSK9 means less LDL because more are being cleared from the bloodstream. That's why there's this whole class of medicine called PCSK9 inhibitors. And they're actually very effective. They can get your uh, blood cholesterol levels extraordinarily low. So with this in mind, let's talk about this study, fasting reducing uh, reduction from PCSK9. And what they did was they took healthy individuals aged 18 to 65, and I think the average, yeah, is like 29. And these are really healthy people. Their fasting glucose and A1C looks really good. Their HDL is high. Their triglycerides are low. And sure enough, they put them on a 48-hour fast. You see their glucose and their insulin drop. That's the dots, the uh, solid and hollow dots. But the squares, that's their ketone levels. 
So we can absolutely confirm that their ketones were going up at the same time. But here's where it gets interesting. They also tracked PCSK9 levels and something called lathosterol to cholesterol levels, which is basically a proxy for cholesterol synthesis. And both of them are going down. That's the dark dot and the, uh, the square, the gray square. I don't have a pointer, so I just have to describe it. But both of those are going down. LDL-C, LDL cholesterol is going up. That's pretty surprising. They say this in the study. They say despite the fall in both PCSK9 and cholesterol synthesis during fasting, levels of LDL-C rose modestly, resulting in a significant but inverse relationship between LDL-C and both plasma PCSK9 levels and rates of cholesterol synthesis. So this is pretty strong evidence that indeed this is, in, especially in the fasting context, that the higher LDL-C can't be explained because of either greater cholesterol synthesis or a difference in the clearance. Now let's look at animal models for fasting because there's quite a lot of great data there. First, I want to go to this very old study that uh, Siobhan found, which is kind of cool. It was published in 1916. I think it was a two-page study. It's, just, it's nice to see a two-page study. You don't get that very often. And it was around rabbits. And it was finding that fasting had a very considerable effect on total cholesterol content in rabbits' livers. In this investigation, we discovered facts outwardly contradictory in their meaning. On the one hand, during fasting, a considerable increase in the cholesterol concentration in the liver and blood was found. On the other hand, the synthesis of cholesterol in the liver, the synthesis, insofar as this could be judged by the rate of incorporation of C14 acetate was greatly reduced. So this too showed the animal model of what I was showing from a bit earlier that actually no, the synthesis has gone down in spite of there being a higher degree of cholesterol found in both the blood and in the liver, which to me seems pretty obviously a greater degree of recycling. This one's great because it's in migratory birds. One remarkable attribute of preparations for migration is the speed with which triglyceride is stored. Fat deposits can increase several fold in a matter of hours. This suggests the existence of specific mechanisms for rapid fuel production, distribution, and deposition. This suggests a unique capacity of the liver of migrating birds for the re-esterification of free fatty acids that sustain the circulating supply of energy in the form of triglyceride-rich, very low-density lipoproteins for use by the muscular system. If that sounds familiar, it's exactly what's on the model. One of the reasons I like a lot of these animal models is there's no, there's no politics around it. They can pretty much just look at a lot of the biochemistry as it sits and then report it as such which actually uh, brings around one of my favorite studies. This is with brown bears, where they point out correctly, hibernation is an extreme physiological challenge for the brown bear. For five to seven months of the year, metabolism is based mainly on lipids from stored fat, while protein synthesis is reduced. Blood samples were collected from free ranging brown bears during hibernation and during their active periods in the summer. They, they were actually, um, they were, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm gonna read past it on the highlight part because they were actually tranquilizing them from a helicopter. I was, I was trying to think, wow, who gets that job? And uh, they also got some samples from hunters that they collected some from uh, myocardial sp specimens containing the left ascending anterior uh, coronary artery and uh, aortic arches. And this is what they found, despite considerable variation in food patterns and physical activity between free-ranging and captive bears, the findings of the present study corroborate that brown bear plasma lipids are elevated during hibernation and that the levels generally are considerably higher than what is normally found in humans. 
You can see this in these two graphs at the top, hibernation on the left side. The total plasma cholesterol and the LDL cholesterol are substantially higher. Despite this and regardless of exposure to other factors cons uh, constituting risks for development of cardiovascular disease in humans, because these are bears, they have obesity, physical inactivity, circulatory slow flow during uh, hibernation, we found no signs of atherosclerosis in brown bears. And I love this, they have a cross section so you can actually see this and, and indeed there's just, there's nothing, there's no atherosclerosis. Further, uh, future studies must determine the biological mechanisms behind the resistance and whether, for example, the inflammatory or antioxidant defense systems, cholesterol recycling, endocrinological changes, or perhaps even how bears handle mental stress <laughs> can improve our understanding. I would put out one of my own, but you can probably guess what that would be. All right, now let's talk about the glycogen connection to all of this. This is a model of a triglyceride, and I put this out here so you can see it in comparison to another kind of model. This is glycogen. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose. And obviously, it's pretty darn big. It's a highly branched polymer of about 30,000 glucose residues. But the thing you really need to care about is this. Glycogen is primarily stored in the liver and muscle. The liver really needs to keep an eye on it. Which brings me to one of my favorite studies ever. This is leptin mediates glucose fatty acid cycle to maintain glucose homeostasis and starvation. Don't worry, I'm not gonna be talking about leptin or, leptin or anything else. Uh, the thing you need to know though is that researchers divided rats into four groups of 0, 6, 16, and 48 hours fasted taking blood and physical measurements of each so you can kind of get a timeline. We have the early fasted state, which they identify that indeed liver glycogen stores start to get used for fuel. This is called glycogenolysis. And liver increases production of glucose. This is gluconeogenesis, which I mentioned earlier. But then you end up in the prolonged fasted state where you see liver glycogen stores are depleted and now liver production of ketones and glucose increases for obligate tissues. So far so good. None of this is really breaking news. Now you see this from one of the many amazing graphs that they have. You see the liver glycogen because they actually got into those hepatocytes, the liver cells. And sure enough, during the same timeline of six hours fasted, 1648, you see plasma glucose going lower and lower. Meanwhile, plasma non-esterified fatty acids are going up, 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 declining, as does plasma glycerol. But what I like is they have some more advanced measurements where we can actually see whole body turnover. So this is whole body fatty acid turnover. And this is whole body glycerol turnover. In both cases, you can see it's really substantially climbed. So, with all of that in mind, let's return to the liver. Because this is probably one of the most key and important parts of the whole model, and maybe one of the most controversial. What we're suggesting is that there's a higher uptake of free fatty acids. And while a lot of those free fatty acids are definitely getting converted to ketone bodies, the bigger question is whether there's some number of them that are also getting re-esterified and then packaged back onto lipoproteins so that there's just overall on net a greater amount of triglycerides leaving the liver on board these boats. Well, I'm happy to say that in this study, we got to see inside those livers to confirm or disconfirm whether we see the cargo being put together. And indeed, we see on one end something called liver membrane DAG. DAG is short for diacylglycerol. Di as in two, as opposed to tri. And that's two fatty acids esterified to a glycerol backbone, which is the precursor to having a triglyceride. And you see at 48 hours fasted, now well into ketosis, there's a higher amount of DAG in these hepatocytes. But we should also see this correspondingly with a higher amount of 
triglycerides or TAG on the other end of the spectrum. And indeed we do. We see liver TAG, triacylglycerol, which is just another name for triglycerides, has also jumped up substantially. Now that said, we don't see higher levels of triglycerides in the blood, but that also fits the model. What they say here, though, is important, and I do want to repeat it, which is that they think what's happening to explain this disassociation between plasma and liver triglycerides is that it can be explained perhaps because it's rate limited, that there's a reduced liver export of those triglycerides into the cargo, into the uh, VLDL. Because if you were to think that it's just you know a static rate, that its turnover has to be static, then it's understandable why you'd have that perspective. But I'm going to offer maybe not. Maybe there is a higher turnover of triglycerides in the periphery. And I'm sorry if I lost a lot of you when I was saying that, but basically the gist of it is this. I think that what could explain why there would be higher levels of free fatty acids clearly in the process of being assembled into the triglyceride cargo, but not see a lot of the triglyceride cargo in the bloodstream at the same time is that it's getting used that much faster because it's now in a fat adapted context. I, I was very privileged to be able to talk to the lead author of this study and uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that she is now floating that around because it's not something that they had thought of at the time that they were putting together the paper. So in summary, data in both low carb and fasting research suggests metabolic health is very relevant to changes in lipid levels. We kind of already knew that on the low carb context, but we didn't know for sure on the fasting side. And it does look as if, yeah, on the fasting side as well, it just matters. Liver glycogen depletion appears to be the central initiator in greater mobilization of lipids for fuel. LDL cholesterol rises during fasting in spite of PCSK9 and cholesterol synthesis falling, providing further evidence of rapid lipoprotein turnover. And finally, animal models of both migration and hibernation showcase a lipid system metabolism that functions very well while fasted. I wanted to thank all the members and patrons who directly contribute to our research. It's, if it weren't for them, uh, this just wouldn't be possible. And I, I want to give a special thanks, a big shout out to Siobhan Huggins and Tommy Wood for their invaluable work in helping uh, research this paper, which we hope this paper will be put together soon and we hope to publish it, but it is a long process. So that's my talk. Thank you once again for joining me.